This is womensleadershipsuccess.com radio, episode number 94. Do you ever wonder why there is such a large gender divide between women and men in senior management positions? Are you curious about the underlying reasons that women aren't making it up to higher levels? Do you want to know the two most important attributes to help you advance your career? Then join me today with leadership, emotional intelligence, and gender divide expert, Dr. Sean Andrews, to learn how you can break the glass ceiling. Also, be sure to listen to the end of the show for a very special announcement for any woman who is committed to expanding and deepening her leadership and career talents. Welcome to Women's Leadership Podcast, showing you how to influence people, improve your performance, and advance your career. Brought to you by women's leadership and career expert Sabrina Brom and womensleadershipsuccess.com. Here's your chance to meet women trendsetters leading the way to success, accomplishment, and balance in business and life. No matter if you're a manager, CEO, or entrepreneur, join Sabrina for coaching and no-nonsense advice to improve your career and bottom line. This is womensleadershipsuccess.com radio. I'm so glad to be here today and to have as my guest, Dr. Sean Andrews. She is a keynote speaker, an organizational consultant, and the founder and CEO of Andrews Research International. She serves as an adjunct professor at Pepperdine University, Grazi Adio Business School, where she teaches courses on organizational behavior, women in leadership, diversity in organ- leadership and ethics. She was a 2017 diversity and inclusion columnist for Training Industry Magazine and is the author of the new book, The Power of Perception, Leadership, Emotional Intelligence, and the Gender Divide. Welcome, Dr. Andrews. Thanks. thanks, thanks excuse me. Thanks, Sabrina. It's great to be here. <laughs> so, um, can I just absolutely loved your book, which I'll I'll talk about a little bit more. And as my audience knows, I read a lot of books, and this is one of the best books I've read all year. And I just appreciate the depth of research that you've done here. Um, and I wonder if you would start by sharing some some statistics that maybe some people know, but maybe some will be surprised. Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, just to give you a little background about how I got onto this topic and why I wrote the book is that when I first heard about these statistics 10 years ago, when they first started being published in the, in the um, mainstream media, I was shocked myself, like many others are. I was just appalled at these stats. Uh, But I was also intrigued about what was behind it. And so that's what compelled me to want to research it in my uh, doctoral dissertation and then also write the book because there's there's so much there. Uh, So so the statistics, uh, there's lots of statistics uh, that that I researched uh, when I wrote when I wrote uh, The Power of Perception. But uh, I'll I'll share a few with you that are real um, real hallmark. So, so women now make up over half of the workforce. So the U.S. labor force, women make up about 52%. Uh, it fluctuates, but, you know, just over half. Um, we, we also know that women make up most professional occupations, so such as attorney and physician, uh, are held by women. And then if you look at education, 60% of bachelor's degrees in both the U.S. and in Europe are obtained by women. So you would think Women are in the workforce, they have the professional degrees, they're getting the experience, and they have the education to back them up. You would, it would be a natural assumption to think that would translate into leadership, but that is simply not the case. And actually, as women climb the corporate ladder, if, if you look at um, the number of female CEOs at our S&P 500 companies, it equals 5%. So the current statistic is actually 5.2%. Uh, but if you if you look again at this S and P 500, that translates 5% translates into 26 female CEOs. And out know, of out of 500, yes, out of 500. 
And so, you know, you may think that, okay, great, there's 26 out there leading, you know, our biggest corporations. That's fantastic. And it is. But it also means there are 474 male CEOs leading S&P 500 companies. So from that perspective, women aren't doing so well. And so uh, we, we have a long way to go still. And what's really, uh, what I found is really discouraging is that this statistic, the 5% statistic has, has been around for about 30 years. Wow. So, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and I, I just saw something recently where a lot of times when women are picked to be the CEOs of company, I, I'm not sure this fits with the Fortune 500, but a lot of times they're calling it uh, the, the glass cliff because they only get picked if the company's going out of business. Yeah. Yes. I, I've seen, yes. I've seen that as well is oftentimes uh, the women who are chosen for those roles, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not the most ideal situation and, and it's companies that were struggling anyways. And so many times it's, it's a kind of a no-win situation. They get hired on and then, and then um, they're kind of set up for failure. So yeah, that has been shown through some studies. So, so um, this is so intriguing, and you know, I've I've thought about it a lot. So many women that listen to this program have thought about it. But in your research, what what did you were you able to pinpoint anything that seems to be a kind of an underlying reason that women aren't making it up to the higher levels? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's actually the hundred thousand dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that was really what I was intrigued about is why, why do we see these numbers? I mean, and there's, there's many more statistics I talk about in the book, but uh, you know, that's just kind of a snapshot in the U S but even looking at, you know, our world leaders only uh, out of 195 countries, only 15 are led by women. So that translates to 8%. So, you know, only 8% of our world leaders are, are, are women. And so um, it's, it's a pretty dismal picture. And so I was really intrigued about why. And so what I found is that uh, it is not one single overarching reason. Mm -hmm. uh, it is multifactorial and there's many different types of barriers. And so what I did is when I looked at all the data and I conducted my own research too, is that it, I, I categorized them into basically four types of buckets if you will, like buckets mm -hmm. of barriers or categories of barriers. And so, and there are different individual barriers within these broader categories. And so, um, you know, fortunately I can't say, you know, it's just gender bias, for example, and that's it, you know, that's the biggest reason. It's not, there are, there are other reasons too. Uh, and then some of these, some of these barriers are pa passed on and reinforced from generation to generation and others, um, you know, we can affect right away just through awareness and dialogue and action. So uh, it, it's kind of a mixed bag, you know, so. Well, I'm thinking, you want me, yeah, well, you want I, me to go? Uh, I, I, maybe it's uh, one of the, as I mentioned to you before we started talking, one of the challenges is this, you've got so much incredible information that um, we could, I, I'm thinking, I'd like you to come back another time and we'll go deeper into some of the areas we don't cover today, if you'd be willing to do that. Um, so, sure. but one of the things that, that I'm wondering is, um, because what we, what, what, what I'm wanting and what the women who are listening want is how do we, how do we begin to break through some of these things? How do we move beyond it? And the thing that I'm wondering is, is it important for us working, women working in corporations or whether we have our own business or whatever we're doing, is it important for us to understand the bias that may be in our industry or in the situation we're in so we best know how to, what kind of strategy to use? Or is there an overall strategy that fits no matter what? And maybe that's uh, a question there. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, you know, and I'm actually someone who likes to, you know, I do the research and I wanted it to be nice and tidy. And, and as, as Brene Brown mentioned in her TED talk, uh, the power of vulnerability, I tried to put it into a nice little bento box, you know, and try and organize it and break it down. But, uh, and, and there's, but 
it's just simply not that, Uh, you know, there's multiple barriers, there's multiple things we can do, um, which is positive, actually, but that's the good news is there's lots of things we can do from both an individual standpoint, but also an organizational standpoint to address the different types of barriers. Okay. Um, So give us, give us one of the buckets. Give us one, give us one. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I think, I think it'll help your listeners kind of wrap their heads around the issues if I just kind of give a quick overview of what the kind of the category is. Okay, are. good, good. Okay, so so the first category of barriers is is what's called structural obstacles. So these are like physical physical reasons why, you know, we don't see more women leading. So one, one of these barriers is lack of access to informal networks. And another name for that is the old boys network. So it's it's still alive and well. Um, and there are still many women who don't have access to these informal networks, such as, you know, sporting events, you know, taking customers out to golf, uh, drinks or dinner after, you know, after a conference. And um, so these informal networks are important because, well, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, people are in a relaxed setting. They tend to let their guard down. You know, they share personal information about themselves, and it's great for uh, relationship building and also for getting intel about not only your company, but your competitors. Mm-hmm. So, 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 you know, who wouldn't want to be in an environment like that? Mm-hmm. But, but, but still, you know, even today, even though many women now, let's say, play golf, for example, we still, it's still a male bastion. Most women aren't, you know, still part of it. You know, golf is still male dominated and, and uh, there are some industries that still, you know, use golf as a, as a key relationship building lever. And Uh so, uh, so that, that's just, that's just one example, but you know, it could be, you know, catching a a basketball game after a conference or something. Um, And actually I'll, I'll give you a a real world example of that is uh, last year, a a pharmaceutical company had a a conference in uh, New York, Mm -hmm. in Manhattan. And they had a free evening. And so uh, a large group of the men decided to go to Madison Square Garden and catch the basketball game. Mm -hmm. And so a large group of women were left at the hotel and they said, well, what are we going to do? And so they decided to go to a nice dinner together. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, the next morning, these groups are sharing about their evening's activities. And one of the men said to the women, why didn't you invite us to dinner? And she looked at him and she goes, why didn't you invite us to the game? So that's, I think that's a perfect example of showing how we simply miss each other and we're not inclusive in our thinking and, and our behaviors. And so in this case, the men just didn't think to invite the women and the women didn't invite the men. And so, you know, but this happens all too frequently. And so, um, so that, that is considered one major barrier is we, you know, women still have a lack of access to these informal networks. Um, and then other examples within this category is, uh, you know, we still need more female role models, uh, more female and male mentors. And then mm-hmm. uh, we also need more, more male sponsors in particular. And so, so that, that's just one, you know, type of barrier. So, uh, you know, this is kind of on a, a totally different level, but I was just working with a woman who was, um, she was in a, a high level meeting in Malaysia. And there was no woman's restroom. She had mm. to she had to go into the male restroom and and use that because there wasn't a female rest, restroom. <laughs> and and restrooms too are places that men congregate and share information, right? <laughs> they are okay. So so that's you know that's actually kind of a funny one because you know we're not going to go parading into the men's restroom to but. Absolutely. And the same with the women's restroom, actually, you know, we go into the restroom and we, you know, we talk uh, in, in the restroom. And so, uh, you know, that's one area that's, you know, uh, understandably off limits to the, to the opposite gender, right? But, um, you know, bar- barring, barring knocking down the door to the men's bathroom. Um, <laughs> there's, there's plenty of other opportunities where, you know, of, of informal networks where, where women could take part. Yeah. And also, um, uh, I, I like your, your story of, the women, the women saying, "Why didn't you invite us?" and the men saying, "Why didn't you invite us?" And it sound, and I know you talk about this a lot in your book of how do we start, how do we start doing that? But I'm now I'm afraid I'm going to get ahead of my questions here. So, um, do you want to say anything else about the buckets before I start asking you some more 
Yeah, 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 sure, sure, I'd be happy to. So, okay. uh, so that's the first one. So another type of category or bucket of barrier is is gender bias and gender stereotypes. So th- and this is a big bucket. Um, and so gender bias is still uh, around uh, and it's still pervasive a- a across all industries globally. Uh, but then we also have other types of biases in here. Um, one is called agentic leader behavior. And what that means is that we tend to associate leader traits with male traits. So I often ask you know, audiences that I speak to is when you think of a leader, you know, what comes to mind? People often say competitive, decisive, confident, assertive, even maybe even aggressive. Uh, don't you don't hear empathetic, great team player, great um, communicator, great at relationships. We don't associate female characteristics with ma- with leader characteristics, mm-hmm. and so that's a, that's a type of bias. And so, mm-hmm. so I, I included that one in this this category, um, and then the other type of bias is called a role with something called role congruity theory. And what that is, is that, you know, we make assumptions of that people have to act in certain ways to be successful in a role. So I'll give you an example, Sabrina, um, take a female leader in the military. So a female could be a fantastic leader, but she may not be met positively by her platoon or the troops that she leads because she's in a role considered considered to be incongruent with a female. Mm-hmm. So we can also look at the other side of the coin. Let's take a male nurse. A male could be a great nurse, but he may not be met positively by those that he, um, from those that he works with or even the patients he cares for because he's in a role considered to be incongruent with a male. And so this and these are types of these are all based in they're rooted in bias. They're not based in fact. Mm-hmm. And we make we make these assumptions. So so all of all of those are in the um, kind of the bucket of uh, of the gender bias you know bucket. And I also want to mention that we have several uh, female military leaders that listen to this program. And mm-hmm. I'm talking around the world that are are looking for suggestions of how to how to deal with this because they're, they're dealing with this so much. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and that and basically that's real congruity theory that they're coming up against is that, you know, we, we have these assumptions, these broad based assumptions that well a, a female can't, you know, can't be a good leader in, a, in the military situation. Well, that's mm-hmm. simply not true. They absolutely can. And my advice to women who is, so if you happen to be in a profession that's male dominated, uh-huh. my advice to you is that, yes, you, you likely will come up against some barriers and some perceptions or misperceptions, but if it's an area that you care about, uh, don't give up on it, you know, keep, stay in there and just know that you're going to hit some bumps in the road, but you can absolutely, you can be successful. It's just going to be, uh, you know, you're, you're going to meet you know, more resistance than you would if you were in a more of a stereotypical female occupation. Right. You're, you're basically, you're the pioneer. You're, you're uh, paving the way for the rest of us. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's been lots of successful stories of women in male dominated occupations who have been successful. Um, My my sister is actually a great example. My uh, older sister has worked in the construction industry uh, for 30 years now. And uh, she started as a basic, uh, I think, uh, started as a civil engineer and then a project manager and worked her way up. And now she's senior vice president. Now, she had some bumps. She absolutely encountered gender bias and obstacles and barriers, but she just, she pressed, pressed on and, you know, and so she she was able to make it to a top leadership level. And so it absolutely can be done, but, um, you know, uh, you're likely, you're going to experience more resistance, but don't give don't give up. Right. So what, any more buckets? Yes. Yes. So, okay. So uh, the third category is what I call individual mindset. And so a large percentage of women actually hold themselves back. So these are internal barriers. Um, So what the data shows is that women tend to get to the director level and then they either stay there and settle in or then they are tend to drop off. Uh, Very few go on past that to the VP, president, or even the C-suite. So 
uh, and, and it's for different reasons too, uh, that women hold themselves back. Um, you know, oftentimes the women that I interviewed in my research, um, and for the book, uh, they shared with me that, you know, they got to a certain level and then they looked at the top and said, I do, I don't want any part of that. You know, I don't want the politics at the top. I don't want to have to, uh, be that political and I value my work-life balance more. And so, and I've heard that repeatedly. And so uh, oftentimes women just want different things than men do. So, Mm -hmm. but, but that I do have it as a, a, a type of barrier because it is one of the reasons we don't see more women leading Uh, And then another example here, Sabrina, is uh, what's called office housework. And that's that uh, as it it implies, it's kind of doing the uh, it's doing the behind the scenes um, tasks that are important to keep a company running smoothly, but often don't get recognized. So examples are like bringing the donuts, for example, um, taking the notes at the meeting, uh, planning the holiday party. Uh, you know, mentoring the new hire. And so there's there's lots of things that women, the vast majority of women volunteer for these activities. And it's because women want to be helpful. And that's a fantastic trait. But again, the downside is they often don't get recognized. And these are time consuming right. activities. And, and so I want, I want to ask you a question about that, Sean, because I, I actually um, ran into this, I've run into it more than one time. And in this particular situation, the uh, the boss was asking the women to to put the conference together, which every year they keep being asked to do that, which is a huge amount of work. And there's a lot of other people in the company, mostly males, that could be doing this. And mm-hmm. um, what I su- what I suggested to them was that they put it out as they thought that other people should have an opportunity to be professionally developed. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any other suggestions, because I see this happening a lot with women where they're kind of slotted into the role of, oh, okay, you're good at the parties, you're good at putting the conference together, and you did such a good job last year, so why don't we just have you keep doing it? Um, yeah. So any suggestions there? Yeah, uh, actually, I'll have, I have two suggestions. Um, the first suggestion, if you're the if you're the in charge of uh, creating the next event, uh, don't assign, don't ask for volunteers because ninety percent of the time women are going to raise their hands and volunteer. Okay. And again, that's a good that's a good thing. Women are being helpful, but I would suggest instead is to assign volunteer. Not, I guess it'd be a voluntold, not a volunteer, but uh, assign. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> You're voluntold. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, so uh, um, select people for these roles. Don't just ask for volunteers because if you select people, then you're in, you're guaranteed to get an even distribution of men and women. Uh, the other, so that's one suggestion. The other suggestion is if you are one of the women, one one of these types of women who do tend to volunteer for these activities, is is let other people have the opportunity. And even though you you are probably fantastic at it, you you probably are the best event planner or meeting or whatever it is. Um, we have to relinquish control at least long enough to allow others and we and step back. So my suggestion is not to always raise your hand. Let other people have a chance to do it. Even though you could do it fantastically, uh, let others have a chance. I love it. So what if, are there buckets? Any other buckets? Yes, yes. <laughs> there are other buckets. Okay. And then lastly, the last major category is uh, what lifestyle choices it's called. And in, in this bucket, I have work-life balance, uh, family choices, and breadwinner caregiver issues. Uh, so I'll give you an example here. Uh, so breadwinner caregiver, for example. If, and this is how the da- what the data currently shows. If a woman is the primary, so, so let me take a step back. And, and most of our households today, most households are two income earners. Mm-hmm. So both spouses work. Mm -hmm. Are both partners work. So if a woman happens to be the primary breadwinner of her household, she's usually the primary caregiver as well. Mm -hmm. If a man is the primary breadwinner of his household, he's rarely the primary caregiver. So that is a key distinction that we even see among millennial men and women. And the fact that, and this is really an important type of barrier because it's, 
we can't, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to be 100% successful at everything. So if you are trying to be successful in your career, but you're also managing the lion's share of the child you know, uh, care duties and the household duties, so meaning you're not only taking care of the child, but you're doing the grocery shopping, you're doing the laundry, and you're doing the cooking and the dishes. Mm-hmm. So you're doing household, you're doing caregiving, and you happen to be the breadwinner. So that that scenario is pretty common nowadays. And so even among millennial women, they still have the lion's share of the breadwinner and the caregiver duty. And so this is an important discussion that the couple needs to have. And I've, I've heard, you know, I've heard some great examples of what some people have done. Sometimes you know, they trade off, you know, so for example, now uh, the the woman, you know, takes time off of her career and focuses on the caregiving and maybe three, you know, a couple years down the line, they relocate for her career and he, he sacrifices, you know, his job. And so there's different ways to work this, um, but have the conversation is what my suggestion is. Uh, believe it or not, uh, even today, couples are not having these candid conversations with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of One of the women that I interviewed uh, worked in the financial industry and she owned her own financial consulting firm. And what she uh, shared with me is that when they had their children, uh, she just, her and her husband did not have the conversation about who would take time off and care for the children. And they simply didn't have that. And I asked her why, I said, why, why didn't you talk about this? And she says, well, I just assumed, I just assumed I'd be the one to do it. And my husband wouldn't want to or, or couldn't, you know, and, and so I, I would I would not suggest that. I would suggest even if you 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 think, you know, have a you you have assumptions, have that conversation with your partner because it's, it's critically important. Um, and so it, it does play into um, advanced career advancement. Yeah. And it's also just because I come from a background of, of being a psychotherapist, it's also better for the relationship. It's better yeah. if you have these conversations and you work it out, um, because at some point, if you're doing all of it, you're going to end up presenting it. Yeah, it's not. It really isn't a good idea. Yeah, it's a great point. What percentage of women are um, single caregivers? Actually, it's very large. It's a large percentage. Um, you know, the last time I looked at those numbers, uh, I think. The, the majority of the two earner households was somewhere in the range of like 70% of households were dual income. Mm-hmm. And then I think, I think like 50, it was about 50 uh, that were single parent households as well, mostly single mother households. And so it's, it's a large percentage. So, so a lot of the women that I'm coaching in companies are single mothers and they're, they're getting promoted and they have good jobs. But what's what's something that a single mother can do to be a better parent and also at the same time to um, be able to manage all of that? Do you have some thoughts on that? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, other than asking for all the help she can. <laughs> I think, well, you know, you know what? I think that is absolutely brilliant because I think a lot of times women don't ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times they don't. And, you know, women tend to be, uh, I mean, myself included, uh, you know, women tend to be achievers and perfectionists. And, you know, we want to do a great job. We want to be great at everything. But when it comes to trying to manage a full-time career with, with being a mother, it's, it's very difficult for anybody, for male or female, actually. Mm-hmm. And so, but, and, um, you know, we try to be super women and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a losing, it's, I'm not saying a losing battle, but it's, it's a very difficult road. And, you know, your single mothers, uh, listeners out there are, are well aware of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not, uh, but, but asking for help is one uh, from, you know, friends and family support, even, you know, colleagues. Uh, who would who would be willing to help out? Uh, who could you know relate? Um, as far as the career career wise, um, is we we haven't talked about it. You know we haven't touched on it yet. But um, getting getting mentors and sponsors is would help help you know your career. Mm-hmm. 
And the, the difference there is a sponsor, you know, uh, excuse me, a mentor helps you in your current role, whereas a sponsor helps you get to your next role. Right. And so it's, critical, it's critically important for, so for women to have male, and I'll say male sponsors. And the reason for that, again, is the optics. It's the perceptions of it. So, um, so I want to give you an example is if you have a high level meeting, of, let's say executives, and Susan speaks up in the meeting and says, I think Jane should be promoted. Jane is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's great, but it may not carry a lot of weight because the perception may be that um, Susan's only supporting Jane because she's another woman. If Bob speaks up and says, Jane's fantastic, I think Jane should be promoted. The perception, again, is going to be that that's going to carry more weight and credibility because if a man stands up and says, Jane is great, we need a promoter. Mm-hmm. And people listen to that. And so I actually, and I talk about that in my book, that it's, so an advocate, so, so that's one reason, first, first of all, is that it carries more credibility. The other reason it's important for women to have male sponsors is that because male, men are, the vast majority of positions of power are held by men. And so men are in those decision-making positions. And so for those two reasons, it's, it's really important for women to seek out male sponsors and male advocates. I think that's such good advice. So um, so one of the questions I had here is, how can women navigate through assumptions and unconscious gender bi- bias to get promoted? And as you've pointed out with all the buckets, we're talking, you know, a huge number of stuff. But the, the reality is we're all having to deal with that. You've mm-hmm. dealt with it. I've dealt with it. it does, if you're working anywhere, you are going to run into this. And so you're saying one of the ways to deal with it is to get to get um, sponsors, to get mentors. That's one way. Very important. What else can a woman do to begin to level the playing field? Well, there's lots of actually uh, for, for the bias in particular uh-huh. or, or for, yeah. So, so, so what I did is I outlined uh, my, my background, by the way, is uh, my corporate background. I was in pharmaceuticals for 22 years, but half of that time was spent in training and development roles. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. so I'm, you know, I, I'm real big on having practical strategies and applications. And so for, and we're not going to you know have the time to discuss all these today, but I, I've, I've taken great care to put strategies for each of these barriers, uh, for each chapter of the book, there's strategies in there. Right. There's so, one, I, uh, I, I can understand you now that you've said your background, because you have a list of questions to ask yourself at the end of each chapter that are the most elegant questions I've seen in a book. And they're, they're, <laughs> each one is so thought provoking. So, yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Sabrina. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so that and that's you know probably my my teaching and my teaching and training background come into life there. But uh, yeah, so so I've included those questions to help people to to really analyze um, themselves and and uh, help them go deep in the topics that they care about. Mm-hmm. So uh, the you know the bias one is uh, it, it's a great question because it is a large barrier and it's it's pervasive. Um, but there are the good news is there are things that we can do from an individual standpoint and an organizational standpoint. So from an individual standpoint is is know that um, we're all biased, first of all, um, and, and that's based on our upbringing, our backgrounds, our values, our assumptions. You know, we we carry these biases with us. Mm-hmm. And so my my first my first thing is to be honest with yourself about any blind spots you may have about biases. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to adopt a mindful approach in, in your interactions with other people and your decision making. So one suggestion I give um, often for individuals is to um, to question your first impression. And the way you can do that is to just pause and allow to take a minute to allow your unconscious thoughts to become conscious. Or another way to say that, your, your hidden biases to become out in the open. Mm-hmm. And so um, questioning your first impression is, you know, often does work. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, as far as an organizational standpoint, um, it, and actually the the organizational one here, I'll put a little more emphasis on because it's actually easier to take bias out of processes than it is out of people. 
And so, you know, from, from an individual standpoint, we need to be aware of it. We need to be mindful. We need to, uh, you know, be open to, to people who are unlike us. Mm-hmm. But from an organizational standpoint, um, there are really some things we can do um, from, you know, from recruiting and hiring all the way to retention. Uh, do you want me to share? Um, yeah, give me give me a couple examples of what what to make it do. Okay, so uh, let's start with recruiting, for example. So what a lot of organizations do is they go to the same, you know, two or three schools uh, to recruit from, mm-hmm. or associations to recruit from. And so an example here from Google is that Google has now spent um, over two hundred sixty five million in unconscious bias training for their managers, mm-hmm. and so they. They started this a few years ago, and they've invested a significant amount of money and time. And so they've put all their managers through this training. And what they realized is that they were going to the same two or three schools to get engineers. And so after they went through the, you know, this bias training, they thought, well, let's expand our pool of recruiters. And so what they did is they started reaching out to geographic areas and schools and you know, engineering schools and things like that. Mm-hmm. that they had not before, and they started getting a more diverse pool of candidates. Oh, very so interesting. That, yeah, and it worked. And, and that is one simple thing an organization can do is to just simply look at where they're recruiting from and expand that, and you, and you do get a more diverse uh, pool. That's interesting, because yeah. I remember asking one company that all their engineers were male, and I asked, I asked them why they didn't have any females. And Mm -hmm. they had basically one university they were going through. That was one thing. And they said, oh, and when we, when we put an ad up, no women apply. Mm. So, (laughs) yeah. Well, and there's, yeah, (laughs) you hear that. Um, The ads, the ads itself is actually can be problematic as well. Um, There, there's actually a software out there and I can't remember the name of it right now, but uh, that, that helps companies to make sure their ads are not uh, are gender neutral. So a lot of times the way they word an ad will actually be a turnoff for women, you know, because they're talking about, you know, competition and, and aggress- just the words they're using are very, are masculine words that tend to turn women off. And so uh, there, there are tools out there for companies to make sure their ads are a little more appealing. Um, so, so that's just, you know, one, one suggestion there, but a- another thing is to have joint and structured interviews. Uh, you know, oftentimes, even, even the biggest companies today, you know, a manager will sit down, so have it going today and just kind of wing it through the mm-hmm. interview. Uh, but uh, bias actually gets introduced uh, in the interview. And that's, that's when bias is actually problematic because when someone walks in the door, what happens right away? Within the first 30 seconds, we're sizing them up, we're making assumptions about them, mm-hmm. and our biases are in play. So, we're, you know, we're looking at their gender, we're looking at their age, we're looking at the color of their skin, and we're making assumptions. So bias is actually in the interview process. Mm-hmm. And so having joint interviews actually with two or three people at one time is a good way to minimize bias. Oh, interesting. Uh, I haven't heard of that being done before. Is that common? You know, it's becoming more common uh, as more and more companies have awareness, they're starting to do it. Uh, But if if you don't have, so joint interviews is a great way to minimize it because then you can debrief with that panel afterwards and say, you know, what do you think? And well, I thought they were great. Well, I didn't, you know, I didn't think so much. Uh, but if you don't have that, if your company is not doing that, you can also have single interviews, but make sure they're structured and make sure you have that debrief after with the other hiring, uh, the other interview team with them. Um, because it's critically important to debrief. Um, you know, I always like to say, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't marry someone based off of a first date. Right? <laughs> we also... <laughs> Uh-huh. We also shouldn't we shouldn't hire someone off of one interview. So you know we need we need other opinions. We need a series of interviews to make a more informed decision. <laughs> Boy, you know I'm I'm trying to figure out which questions to ask you because <laughs> we're going to run out of time here. And I'm um so let's see what's the difference between transactional and transformational leadership? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, so in chapter, I think my very my second chapter, actually, right up front, I talk about leadership styles. 
Uh-huh. And what's, inter- what's interesting about this is there's tons and tons out there on leadership, tons of research, right, that's been done on leadership. Uh, so there's, there's over 30 different leadership styles out there. And I'm sure your, your listeners uh, have heard about them, like um, um, situational leadership and transactional leadership and transformational and, mm-hmm. um, you know, LMX and, um, you know, it goes on and on and on. Mm-hmm. But what, what I, so I looked at all those styles and, and what the data shows is that overall, men and women are equally effective leaders. But what I found really fascinating is that there is a gender difference when it comes to transactional and transformational in particular. So uh, what transactional leadership is, is basically it's an even exchange of transactions between leader and follower. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. You know, I'll help you now with this and I'll make sure you get the next promotion. That's an example of transactional leadership. Mm-hmm. Trans- and so, so that's been around a long time. And that type of leadership is associated with male, the male style of leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, transformational leadership is very different. So that's built around um, more, um, uh, more even levels of collaboration, problem solving, decision making, more joint, um, joint. Uh, collaboration, mm-hmm. uh, but it's also based on emotions, values, ethics, and long-term goals. So women naturally have those strengths. So, so I and I like to to remind women of this is is women have these strengths inherent in them, and they're very good at those characteristics. Uh, but and the data has shown that transformational leadership is the type of leadership we need today in our contemporary organizations that are, you know, fast paced, competitive, global, uh, and highly matrix. So the transformational type where the leader and follower are actually making joint decisions, working together, they're building relationships. And in that process, they're both transformed, hence the name, and they're both inspired to higher levels of performance. So that's the type of leadership we need for contemporary organizations, and women naturally have those skill sets. Nice. And so, how do they? How can they? Um, how can they maximize those characteristics and show the companies that this is really a, a good thing for them to get promoted and be using? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what women can do, and I'll give you a few suggestions. So first of all is leverage their empathy. Um, it was, so I looked at uh, emotional intelligence as part of my research. And, mm-hmm. it, and for all the EQ skills, um, empathy is the one where women are three times higher than men. So women are markedly higher. And so leveraging your empathy actually will help you maximize your transformational leadership skills. Um, your listening skills uh, is another thing that women can leverage. And that actually goes along with empathy. Um, you know, we have to be good listeners and able to put ourselves in each other's and the other person's shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing that women can do to maximize their strengths is to, is women tend to be very good at teamwork and collaboration mm-hmm. is to leverage. It's just leverage it, you know, maximize that. If, if you're good at it, keep doing it um, and, you know, getting better at that. So that's, uh, another thing, and then leveraging your relationships too. Um, and if, and again, from an emotional intelligence standpoint, that's one area that women tend to score higher than men in is interpersonal relationships. So simply leveraging those things can help help your female listeners, actually, and your male listeners, um, be better transformational leaders. Mm-hmm. And and improve employee engagement, which is a, a big thing in a company. Absolutely. And and that actually goes along with um, the transformational leadership, too, that's been shown that people are more engaged, they're more energized, you know, they tend to stick around, uh, you have better retention. And so there's all kinds of positive things that come out of being a transformational leader. Um, So I, a lot of, a lot of the women I've worked with, say, I don't want to get involved in office politics, which, Mm. um, Kind of, it makes it pretty difficult to get promoted. And so my question is, uh, talk about informal networks and why these are important for women to participate in. It's a, a kind of a different frame than office politics. 
it's right. <laughs> it's a different way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And frank, yeah, framing, it's a good, a good word. Um, it could be perceived as politics. Uh, absolutely. But you could also frame it as your, as a relationship building, you know, key relationship building that's necessary. And, and as I mentioned before, in these types of settings, you know, people, let their guard down, they share information, you build relationships. Um, it, it, they're critically important. Um, and, and I'll give you an example is, you know, um, let's say, let's say your boss, let's say you have a, a, you know, a male boss and they're thinking about who's in line for the next promotion. Who do they think of? It, it, you know, it's often the guy that they play racquetball with or, you know, have they played golf with several times or they dined with several times? So it's the people they've built the relationships with. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's, it's critically important. I also teach, you know, I teach a MBA, uh, I teach an MBA program at Pepperdine and a lot of my students are millennials. And I just, just last semester, I actually had one of the female students share with me that she works at uh, works, actually works at Apple <laughs> in an Apple store. And, uh, there was a group of her male colleagues that were having an informal, kind of an informal network every week for two years, and she had she had no idea that it was going on. Mm. She just was she just wasn't invited to it. Mm-hmm. And they, they were they were getting together after work, you know, once a week. They chit chat, have drinks, and you know how how much better are their relationships because of that now uh-huh. you know and she when she found out she was shocked because she worked with these guys every day and she had no idea that they were meeting on a weekly basis for two years so mm-hmm. that's just it's just an example of how women still many women are left out of these networks so um, uh, so I, I would say to women uh, you know reframe it not as necessarily a political thing but as a as a as a be a powerful tool that can help boost your career. And if, if you're a, if you're a male listener uh, right now, I would encourage you to invite the women, you know, into the network. Uh, and if you're a female listener, I would suggest you to, to ask to be a part of it and participate. Mm-hmm. And it's a good thing to ask your sponsor or your mentor, which absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because they can help Absolutely. get you into those. So you say that there's two attributes that will help to advance your career. What what are those attributes? Oh, <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, there are actually lots. There's lots of different attributes, and you know we have such a we vary so much individually. Mm-hmm. But um, from from a, from emotional intelligence perspective, if I would think the two most important attributes for women in particular uh-huh. is, is confidence and assertiveness. Okay. And we, you know, we often hear, well, you know, women, um, and, and, and it's true sometimes that women don't have the confidence to take on the new challenge or to take mm-hmm. a risk. And so women, when women, women tend to be more calculated in their, in their decisions. And so, and that's actually a good thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we sit back, we calculate, we take things in, but because of that, because of the calculation and the rumination, we all act. Mm-hmm. And so, so having the confidence, uh, to take risks and by taking risks and trying new things, that's going to give you more confidence. Mm-hmm. And so, that's that's one thing I think in the area that women can benefit from. And the other is assertiveness. And assertiveness is not aggressiveness. You know, assertiveness is simply communicating your needs um, in an, um, it's, it's not an aggressive way, but, but communicating your needs to make sure your voice is heard. And oftentimes women uh, will sit back in meetings uh, or perhaps in a conversation with their bosses, they won't speak up and share you know, their concerns and their needs. And so I, I would encourage you to do that if it's a, a topic that's important to you. What, what's a good way to practice that? What, how, so let's say you're a little intimidated or you're used to not taking the floor. What's a good way to um, get better at that? Uh, well, if, well one, thing, one thing you could do is is, is I would start with asking your trusted colleagues about their impressions of your strengths and weaknesses and, uh-huh. and letting go of negative self-talk because often for women in particular, negative self-talk is something that tends to inhibit, you mm-hmm. know, our actions and we, we don't speak up. So letting go of that and then asking people, you know, get, getting an assessment of, of how you're perceived will, 
will go a long way um, in that sense. And and asking somebody to give you feedback after a meeting can be good. Yeah. And also getting somebody that will support you if you say something. So absolutely, yes, yeah, like a like a a wingman, a buddy. But get a wingman so that if you say something and somebody steps on what you just said, they can say, "Hey, wait a second, Sean just said da da da." They can help you to get stronger that way, so you don't feel totally alone. I I just. The other day, somebody said to me they were in a meeting with, there were 40 men, and there were only two women in the room. Mm-hmm. And um, that many times they would get stepped on with, with something they were saying, and then they started getting men that were supportive that would step up and say, good idea, or you know make a comment yeah. right then. The other thing I've found, Sean, is it's good to practice in advance. In other words, if you if you have something that you think is really important and you would really like it, you would like to make that point in a, a meeting, really, really do your homework and not only come up with your idea, but think about what objections might come up and start, even write it down, answer those objections. So when you walk into that meeting, you you've already practiced some. You're not just walking in cold. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those are great suggestions. So um, what are some strategies? Um, let's see. We already asked that. What are, what are some strategies that can help women build alliances and support each other? How do we do that? You know, in the past, a lot of women haven't been supportive of other women. and. Um, it seems like it's happening more. What do you think? And yeah, yeah, there, uh, there are a few reasons I actually, and I go into in the book is, is to explain why women tend to cut each other, if you will, cut, uh-huh. um, or not support each other. And then there, it's, it's different. There are different reasons for it. Uh, but it is, I do think it is getting better, um, uh, because we have more aware, awareness of it now. Uh, but I, I think just what you said about actually having, um, someone advocate for you and support you, um, you know, having a wingman, if you will, uh, uh, will go a lot in supporting other women. And, and another thing you can do is, is be a wingman. You not only have a wingman, but be a wingman. So if you, if you're, if you're a coworker, if you're in a, a meeting or a project team, you know, you could say, you know, I'll, I'll go with Jane again, you know, you know, Jane's actually worked really hard on this project and she was able to, you know, bring in, you know, 20 new clients, really, you know, and, so you can actually promote on behalf of someone else. And that often carries more credibility than you doing it yourself. And so um, I think we could, we could do, we, there's no end to that one. I mean, we could, we could promote other women in that way. And it's something very easy to do. And it's a, it's a really good thing to, to practice. And it's going to help build more alliances, women helping other women, which is, such an important part of of changing all these stat- statistics. We're we're just about out of time, and um, I have a Facebook Live every Thursday at three p.m. on Pacific Time. And I'm wondering um, when the show comes out, maybe um, a couple weeks after that, if you would be willing to come on a Facebook Live, and if somebody has some more questions from all the wonderful things you've been sharing with us, that's a forum where they can actually ask a question and get a, get an answer right then. Would you be willing to do that? I would love to. Oh, great, great. So let's plan that out. And um, uh, I have at the end of the show, I tell how you can find out what's, when things are coming up on the Facebook Live and I'll uh, put it up when Dr. Andrews is going to uh, be coming onto the show. So is there any anything you want us to know before we say goodbye here? Is there one last <laughs> piece of information you'd like to leave us with? Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, and, and there's, you're right. We could talk for days about these topics wow. because there's, there's a lot in the book. There's a lot of different topics, uh, a lot, it goes a lot of different directions and a lot of depth. But my overall message to your listeners would be, it would be to be persistent and don't give up on your aspirations. You know, whatever those aspirations may be, you know, not everyone wants to be president, you know, or vice president, or maybe it's just to be successful in your current role. 
maybe it's just to get you to the next level and that's it, you know, that's, and that's perfectly fine, but, but don't give up. Um, you know, there's lots of barriers we talked about today. Um, and, you know, the more that we have awareness of the barriers and then, and then apply the strategies, you know, the, um, the more tools we'll have in our, in our toolkit. So, uh, be persistent and don't give up on your dreams. Oh, beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrews, for taking the time to meet with us today. And um, I look forward to having you back on the program and to doing the Facebook Live and hearing what other questions people might ha- have. So thanks again. Absolutely. Thank okay. you. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Are you committed to expanding and deepening your leadership and career talent? Would you like to know how to leverage yourself for greater success? For quite a while, I've been putting together a unique program based on my over 25 years of helping women succeed and the over 100 women and men leaders I have interviewed that will absolutely help you enhance your career and leadership. I will be offering this one-of-a-kind six-week program to the public in the late fall. What is exciting for me is that before I take this special program to the public, I've decided to invite a small group of motivated women and female clients to be part of my inner circle and take them through this program, which starts in August. If you are committed to taking your career and leadership to the next level and need a clear picture of you as a transformational leader, my program, Activate Your Career Building Superpowers, can help you get there. If any of this sounds intriguing, I'd like to invite you to hop on a quick call with me to explore if you qualify to be part of this exclusive group and my upcoming program. Simply shoot me an email at information at womensleadershipsuccess.com or go to www.womensleadershipsuccess.com and fill out the box on the right. Bye for now and thanks for listening. Thank you for joining your host, Sabrina Brom, on another Women's Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email her at sabrina at sabrinabrahm.com. Since 1989, Sabrina and her team have helped hundreds of women managers, business leaders, and entrepreneurs with valuable trainings, articles, books, and executive coaching. For additional tips, interviews, and free access to Great Leaders Today mini-course, visit www.womensleadershipsuccess.com.